So in this video, well, what we're going to look at is the solution that we found in the last video and how it relates to the different parameters of periodic motion that we discussed, such as the amplitude. Okay, so now we want to understand this solution that we've derived. And so here we've got a plot of our solution. x of t is equal to a cos omega t plus phi. And the x-axis, the y-axis here uh, shows our displacement x, and the x-axis shows our time t. So even don't be confused by the fact that our displacement, which is called x, is actually on the y-axis. Um, this is a convention of physics. You always plot time along the uh, x-axis. Okay, so we're all familiar with the cosine function, and we know that it goes between um, minus 1 and plus 1. So when we multiply it by a, we're going to go between minus a to plus a. And so that means that this distance here is just equal to a, and so is this distance here. So this is the maximum displacement from our equilibrium position. Remember, our equilibrium position is when x is equal to 0. So this line is x equals 0. So our displacement from that here is a. And so a is just the amplitude. So we've defined what our constant a is. Now, let's have a look at phi. Well, when t is equal to 0, this means that x is equal to a cosine phi. So as we decrease phi to 0, then our displacement will become uh, equal to a. And as we increase phi, then our displacement will decrease. And so if you actually look here at the distance for this peak relative to our time equals zero axis, this distance here is phi, right? So as phi goes to zero, this distance goes to zero, and we get our maximum displacement at time t equals zero. As phi increases, it shifts this whole curve off uh, um, in the negative x direction. So it moves the whole curve horizontally towards negative x as phi uh, increases. So phi is equal to the initial phase. So what do we mean by phase? Well, phase is the argument of this cosine term here. And that represents the point um, through the cycle. So if you see here, if we look at one whole oscillation, you go down here, you go up, you go and you go back down to the equilibrium position. So that, during that one complete cycle, the phase varies by 2 pi, right? So you start with a zero phase here, um, if we define this to be zero, and then you increase the phase as you go through this cycle. And so by the end of the cycle, you end up with a phase 2 pi uh, uh, greater than where you were at the start of the cycle. And as we know, as you go through, um, if you increase the argument of a cosine or sine function by 2 pi, uh, when we're talking radians here, of course, or when you increase it by 2 pi, you get the same result. So phi here is just the initial phase um, of the wave. So these two quantities here, the amplitude and the initial phase, these are determined by the starting conditions. Right? So the initial conditions of the system determine both the phase and the initial phase and the amplitude um, of the system. And they are not intrinsic to the actual system itself. In other words, you know, for different mass spring systems, even though the mass and the spring may be different, uh, maybe exactly the same, I can give them different amplitudes and different initial phases just by starting them off um, at, at different positions and with different initial velocities. So these two quantities we are called the uh, they're also called the boundary conditions. Uh, here, of course, it's not a physical boundary; it's a boundary in time. This is, these are determined by the conditions of the system at the initial point of time, so the initial time boundary. Okay, so the next question that we have is what about the uh, uh, frequency of the system? 
So if we look here, here's our solution. X of t is equal to a cos omega t plus phi. So the period, remember, we said was the time it takes for the system to go through one complete oscillation. So let's look at starting here when t is equal to zero. If we go through one complete oscillation, right, it's not just getting back to the same point because at this point, right, the amplitude is still increasing, whereas here the amplitude is decreasing. So we've got to go all the way around, and so it's getting to this point here. So this length of time between these two points is going to be equal to the period capital T. So the question is, is what, what, where, how do we determine the period from this uh, uh, relationship here? Well, we've said that when t is equal to zero, we have that the displacement is a times the cosine of phi. So the next time we get there is when we've got a times the cosine of 2 pi plus phi. And that's going to be the next time that we get to the same phase. Right? So we've gone through a phase of change of 2 pi between this point and this point. So this means that the length of a period is going to be omega times the time of a period, t, and that must be equal to 2 pi, because a period is when you've gone through a phase change of 2 pi radians, and so therefore the period is 2 pi divided by omega. So the period of the system is inversely proportional to this quantity omega. And remember, for our mass spring system, we said that omega was equal to um, uh, sorry k divided by m, which means that as the uh, mass increases, omega decreases. As k, the spring constant, increases, omega increases. So if we rearrange this, we can say that omega is equal to 2 pi over the period. Now, 2 pi, we said we're using radians, so these are radians here. The period is a time, so it's measured in seconds. So omega has units of radians per second. And so we call omega is equal to the angular frequency. Now, we know that the actual frequency of oscillation is equal to 1 over the time period. Remember, these are the number of oscillations per second. So it's 1 divided by the time of a single period in seconds. This gives us the frequency. So if we use this equation here, we can say that the frequency is equal to omega over 2 pi. And so therefore, omega is equal to 2 pi times the frequency of the system. And so that's the relationship between the angular frequency here, omega, and the actual frequency, f. And remember, this, of course, is measured in hertz, which is equal to seconds to the minus 1. This is measured in radians per second. And since 2 pi here is radians, you know, we multiply radians by per seconds, and you get units of radians per second. So that is consistent in terms of units. So we've now explained all the aspects of this solution. A here is the amplitude, omega is the angular frequency, and phi here is the um, initial phase of the system. And phi and A are determined by the initial conditions of the system. Omega is determined by the physical characteristics of the system. So for uh, the same mass and the same spring, omega will always be the same, but A and phi will depend on how you started the system oscillating. OK, now we've done quite a bit of uh, maths here, so let's go back to the original system and just quickly summarize what we've covered um, in this video. So here we have our mass m attached to a spring with a constant k sitting on a frictionless surface. And what we've said is that our solution for the position as a function of time is a cosine omega t plus phi where omega here is equal to the square root of k over m, and this is the angular frequency. And a here is the amplitude, and 
phi here is the initial phase. So this function describes how this system uh, will oscillate uh, in time. Now, the one thing to note about this is that our angular frequency here is independent of the amplitude. So what this means is, is that I can actually increase the amplitude of the system by, you know, say a factor of two, and it will have no effect on the period of the system. So if we look at that, right, if we, if we plot it in a rough sketch here, if I do a low amplitude oscillation, then I will end up with something that looks like this. If I do a high amplitude oscillation, I will end up with something that looks like this. Now, this appears to be slightly counterintuitive because in this case here, I've got a large distance moved. Um, and so you would expect that it would take longer than the case of the small amplitude here where you're moving a small distance. However, for simple harmonic motion, which is the type of motion that we've been describing here, for simple harmonic motion, the frequency of the motion is independent of the amplitude of the motion. And this is a characteristic that's peculiar to simple harmonic motion. So let's go and see that in action and see whether, you know, since we're doing physics, we're interested in how reality behaves. And so let's see if our mathematical solution actually agrees with a real physical system. So one of the startling predictions from the maths that we've just done is that the period of the motion is completely independent of the amplitude. Now this seems a little bit counterintuitive because if I have it oscillating by a small distance like this, the mass isn't moving that far, whereas if I give it a large amplitude motion, it's traveling a lot further, right? So it's a bit surprising to get that result, but let's see if it's correct. So what I've got here is I've got two springs with roughly identical spring constants, and I've attached identical masses to the end of them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give this one a small amplitude and I'm going to give this one a large amplitude and we'll see whether they oscillate with the same frequency. And as you can see there, they are both oscillating at roughly the same frequency. It's not precisely identical because it's very difficult to get two springs with identical constants. But you can see there that the maths is basically correct, our predictions are right, that doesn't matter what the amplitude is, the frequency of the oscillation is purely determined by the spring constant and the mass independent of the amplitude. The other thing I can do actually is independent, it's independent of how I set them off. So if I pull this one down and I pull this one up, you can see again that they're oscillating with roughly the same frequency, but now out of phase instead of in phase. So, so far the maths seems to be working and our predictions are holding consistent with what we're observing in a qualitative fashion experimentally. So what we saw from the maths was that the higher the spring constant, the more rapid the vibration. So the higher the frequency or the lower the period. And for a larger mass, you had a longer period or lower frequency. So what we've got here is we've got two springs. So this red spring here has got a low spring constant. We'll call this spring constant K. And the spring constant for the green spring is about twice that, to within about 10%. So this is a, a 2K spring constant. On the end of the uh, red spring, I've got half a kilogram mass. On the end of the green spring, I've got a one kilogram mass. So roughly, what we would expect is that the frequency of oscillation of both of these systems would be about the same. Now, one of the things we're doing here is, of course, I have a vertical spring rather than a horizontal spring with the mass resting on a frictionless surface. Uh, frictionless surfaces are a little hard to come by, um, and what we'll see later is that, in fact, you get exactly the same motion here as long as you talk about the displacement from the equilibrium position, which is where the mass is sitting uh, now. So we'll get the same maths that we had before, uh, and you'll just have to trust me on that for the moment.
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that these have roughly the same period of vibration. I'm not going to do them uh, side by side because these spring constants are not exactly uh, a factor of two difference. They're only to within 10%. And this system is very sensitive to small changes in mass. In fact, this is the physics behind what's called an inertial balance, which you can actually use to measure the mass of an object by seeing how fast it causes a, a spring to vibrate when it's attached to the end of it. So here we go with the spring constant K, and you can see it oscillating up and down uh, with a particular frequency. So uh, keep an eye on that, and then I'll stop this, and I'll show you that this one oscillates at roughly the same frequency. So not a very quantitative comparison, but at least qualitatively you can see that the two vibration frequencies are roughly the same. Now. If you look at this one, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take off one of the half kilogram masses, so I'm reducing the mass. So what's that going to do to the period of the motion? Well, if I reduce the mass, it should decrease the period or increase the frequency. So let's see if that's what happens. So here I'm taking off half a kilogram. And you can see now that indeed it, the frequency has increased significantly by about a factor of root two, um, which we got from the maths. And that, unfortunately, I have to stop it because it couples into the uh, pendulum mode of vibration. So here we'll go back to the uh, uh, spring with the uh, spring constant, the K, so the small spring constant. This is it with half a kilogram mass. And now I'm going to add half a kilogram to it. And so you would expect if I increase the mass, that the period uh, increases or the frequency decreases. So that was half a kilogram, and now I'm going to add another half kilogram to make a whole one kilogram mass on the end. And here it goes. And you can see now that the period is a lot greater and the frequency uh, uh, has correspondingly decreased. So although we've done a qualitative comparison here rather than a quantitative one, you can see that these systems are behaving consistent with the maths that we've done to predict their frequencies. And so this is the end of the video introducing simple harmonic motion.